After watching this lecture, you should be able to interpret the reticulocyte count, which is the percentage of red blood cells that are reticulocytes. Now, why is this important? Well, the reticulocyte count is desperately important in figuring out what kind of anemia you're talking about, someone who has a low hemoglobin or hematocrit. And so, uh, interpretation of this uh, very simple blood test gives you a lot of information about how to think about a patient with anemia. Now, if we go back to the basics and look at um, red blood cell development in the bone marrow, we can get a better idea about what the reticulocyte is and why it's so important. Now, if we start here, we can see these green cells are blasts. They're red blood cell precursors. And we have this big one here, the proerythroblast. Then it develops into the basophilic erythroblast and the polychromatic erythroblast and then eventually the orthochromic erythroblast. And you can see that um, in each stage, the red blood cell is getting smaller. The red blood cell precursors are getting smaller. And this very important step here is the extrusion of the nucleus, which you can see is occurring in the marrow, to become a, uh, a reticulocyte uh, or a polychromatophilic erythrocyte. Now this is a baby red blood cell, um, and it's not quite a red blood cell yet because it still has residual uh, ribosomes and RNA and some other organelles, and those have to be uh, degraded um, to make uh, full room for the hemoglobin uh, that carries oxygen around uh, maximally by the erythrocyte. Now um, you can see here that um, there's a little bit of a maturation period, uh, one day or so roughly, in the bone marrow, and then the reticulocyte comes out into the circulation where it spends about, let's say, another day or so before it loses that residual ribosomes uh, and RNA and becomes a, a baggie, essentially, of hemoglobin carrying around oxygen to the tissues. Now, um, what we also have to consider is that the red blood cell uh, has a certain lifespan. Um, and, and most people like to think uh, about 100 days or 120 days or so before the membranes get oxidized, um, they get a little stiffer, and the, and the, spleen, um, the spleen capillary microcirculation and macrophages uh, um, remove the, the senescent red blood cells from the circulation at about a rate of, let's just say, 1% a day, just to use an easy number. Now, what that means is that uh, if we want to stay in steady state uh, and, and not have our hemoglobin fall from the removal of these red blood cells, or, or hematocrit, um, we need to replace those red blood cells that are lost, and the marrow then is going to be producing new red blood cells at about a rate of 1% a day, roughly. Um, and so uh, the reticulocyte that you see in the circulation is a reflection of that. And so a normal value then of your reticulocyte that you'd be measuring in the circulation would be about 1%, okay? Uh, plus or minus a half a percent. Uh, one, again, 1% is kind of an easy number to remember. So if you go back and think about the um, reticulocyte count, the lab reports it as a percentage of red blood cells that are retics, a normal value is on the order of about 1%. about 1%. Now, the problem with this is that these values for normal are for people without anemia. And you really wouldn't order a reticulocyte count or even, even be looking at the reticulocyte count unless it was someone who had anemia. And so, um, since it's a percentage of red blood cells that are reticulocytes, if your red blood cell mass falls and your reticulocyte uh, number doesn't change, the percentage is going to be erroneously increased and give you a false idea about uh, the, the red blood cell production by the bone marrow. So what we need to do are uh, some corrections to account for this. So the first correction, okay, is just a correction for the anemia. And what we would call this is the corrected, this is called the corrected reticulocyte count. I'm just going to write retic count. All right. And this is going to be equal to the reticulocyte count 
all right, times the patient's hemoglobin concentration or hematocrit divided by normal hemoglobin or hematocrit. All right, so depending on which one you want to use, um, you get the same general idea. Now, you might be wondering, well, we know that for hemoglobin and hematocrit, there's ranges, you know, it's, it's not a, a single number. And on top of that, you know, men and women have some slightly different uh, normal ranges. Um, the easy way around that is just to pick a number that's kind of in the middle or, or it, it's in that normal range and, and that's going to get you a general idea. You don't have to be precise here, you just have to get a feel for a correction. And so a typical number that's used is something like maybe 14 for the, for the hemoglobin and maybe like something like 45% for the hematocrit. Um, and, and different people use different numbers, but th those, are, those are good ones to, to play with. Now, the, the issue is that if we happen to have a overstimulation of the marrow that results in an, uh, such a, a massive stimulation of the marrow that these retics here, that normally are supposed to spend about a day in the marrow, uh, roughly, come out into the circulation prematurely, and call these sort of young retics, uh, they, they hang out in the circulation for an extra day and that then gives you an erroneous uh, percentage because that's counting an extra day's worth of, of production when you're just looking at um, the production for, for a day, right? You have these extra retics that are around that are just, just lingering around for, for an extra, for pretty much, um, in this case, twice as long. So we have to take that into consideration and so you, you probably would say, well, um, how do I know if that's happening? How can I tell these retics from those retics? Well, an easy way to figure it out is if you see nucleated red cells on the peripheral blood smear, if you had a smear and you saw nucleated red blood cells, you shouldn't see those at all. They're supposed to be uh, in the bone marrow. And if you saw those in a peripheral blood smear, then, then you can assume that these retics are coming out uh, too soon and they're falsely elevating your, your retic uh, count. Um, so that's, 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 that's a, a blood smear way of, of figuring it out. Um, alternatively, um, you can just say, well, if the hemoglobin is, is, or hematocrit's really low, then uh, you can just assume that that's happening. You know, that's sort of a, a, a way of doing it without the peripheral smear. But either way, if there's a, um, a, a really a robust simulation of the marrow, we need to do a second correction, right, to account for those reticulocytes that are hanging around the circulation longer. And so we can call this the second correction, all right? And this has a special name. This is called the reticulocyte production index. Or RPI. All right. So, so the reticulocyte production index is the corrected retic percent, or retic count, divided by a correction factor. And if the red blood cell uh, production is, is, is stimulated so much that you have early retics, instead of it being one day, which the correction factor would be one, you'd have a correction factor, let's say, of two. So um, this just, you know, usually two, okay? Uh, and it, people have different uh, ways of doing it based on the degree of anemia. Um, some people use 1.5 if it's mild, they use two if it's sort of moderate, and then they use a bigger number if it's severe. Um, a, an easy way to do it is just divide by two, and that gives you a rough idea, and, and, and that's, that's, a, that's an easy way to, to think about it initially. Okay, so we have these two corrections, and um, ultimately what we want is the RPI, the reticulocyte production index, because that's very helpful in figuring out if uh, the anemia is a problem with production from the bone marrow 
Um, or, or on the other hand, if, if the bone marrow is adequately responding, this may be something like a hemolytic event. Okay, so this is, this is how you would do the corrections and how you would properly interpret the reticulocyte count. Now, let's look at an example of how you might do this. And this is an example of a patient coming in with a hemoglobin of 7 grams per deciliter, which is pretty low, and a retic count of 6%. Now, initially, if you didn't know about these corrections, you would say, wow, this is a six-fold increase in bone marrow production, right? So that's, that's very good. The bone marrow, can, if it's allowed to and it's healthy, can, can, can increase the retic count eight-fold, maybe even tenfold. So this is a pretty robust number if this was actually reflecting what was happening. But we have anemia, right? So we can't, we can't use this number. We need to do the first correction. We need to calculate the corrected reticulocyte count, all right? And so this is going to be our um, uh, 7 grams per deciliter right, divided by, let's say, 14 grams per deciliter as our um, correction for the anemia times 6%, right? So we take our reticulocyte count, and now we've multiplied and, and corrected for the degree of anemia. In this case, we're using 14. It's an easy number. 7 over 14 is a half. So this ends up being something like 3%. All right, so, so what we did here was we just took the, the patient's hemoglobin and divided by a normal hemoglobin. In this case, we used 14. Could you have used 13? Could you use 12? Sure, you could have, um, but we're just trying to get a rough idea. So, so now, do we need to do another correction, right? We want to calculate the reticulocyte production index. Well, in this case, we don't have a peripheral blood smear. I didn't, I didn't tell you that there's nucleated red cells, but um, the hemoglobin is less than 10, so we can assume that um, the, the, the bone marrow should be, should be, under these circumstances, kicking out reticulocytes that are, that are going to hang around, hang around longer in the circulation. So if we wanted to do the RPI, which is the second correction, right, we would take the 3%, and we divide by a correction factor, in this case, um, you know, um, with this degree of anemia, may maybe you might, maybe you would, you would use a number that's greater than two, but you don't really need to do that because we can already start to see the picture here that um, this is going to be an inadequate response to this degree of anemia. Okay, so this is something like 1.5 percent. So this is saying that the bone marrow is just increasing bone, uh, the red blood cell production, you know, just a little bit. Um, and for someone who has such a profound anemia, um, this, is, this is terribly inadequate. And, and we would expect that this number might even be going to be falling even more. So that this patient's bone marrow is not compensating well for, um, for, for their degree of anemia. And typically, uh, when we have RPIs of less than 2, we start to think that there's something the matter with the bone marrow in terms of its production. And uh, maybe if it's greater than three, we start, we start to say, well, the bone marrow is responding to some, some degree, and um, it's, it's probably a, a lesion of the red blood cell outside the bone marrow, um, like, like a hemolytic process. So this is a really good example to work through because it shows you how you, would do the, how you would do the corrections and how you would get a more accurate picture about what the bone marrow is doing. Now, what if the hemoglobin, um, what if the hemoglobin was 11? you know, or, or something like that. And um, in that case, you could still calculate an RPI, right? It would just be divided by one. The correction factor would be one because the typical lifespan of the reticulocyte is one day. So, so, so you could still do an RPI. Um, it's, it's just that the correction factor is just one, so it, it's no different than the number that you do with the first correction. So hopefully these examples, this particular example, and a review of the red blood cell development process gives you a better idea about how to interpret the reticulocyte count and, and, and it's especially important, like we said, for anemia because we, we look at the reticulocyte production index to classify what kind of anemia
um, um, the patient might have. And that concludes the lecture on interpretation of the reticulocyte count.